Good morning, everyone. So if you could please take your seats slowly. We are already behind schedule, and we have very interesting and intense topic to discuss. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CPDP in person again after a long break. Um, we will be uh, discussing assessing the impact of fundamental rights in uh, artificial intelligence AI applications. We have a truly stellar lined up of speakers, so let us start right away, not to waste any time. My name is Anna Buchta. I'm the head of policy and consultation unit at the European Data Supervisors Secretariat. Um, we uh, provide opinions on legislative proposals that the Commission puts out with impacts on privacy and data protection. And we have also uh, collaborated with the European Data Protection Board. We always have these acronyms eh, to confuse people. So EDPS together with the EDPB uh, issued a joint opinion on the AI Act when it was uh, adopted a little over a year ago. So this proposal obviously looms large over um, all discussions about regulatory and other approaches to, to AI. Um, we will not be, uh, unlike the past pa previous panel, we will not be normalizing facial recognition. We will not be promoting uh, predictive policing. On the contrary, we will, want, we will be discussing how to make sure that AI applications are actually centered around human rights and fundamental rights considerations. Um, nevertheless, you are probably aware that also the proposal for the AI Act uh, relies heavily on uh, risk management schemes, risk assessment. Uh, and conformity assessments, both based on internal controls and performed by uh, third, part third parties. Um, it includes, it refers to a risk of adverse impact of fundamental rights as one of the criteria for identifying uh, high-risk systems. So, of course, we could have a long discussion why this is not fully adequate uh, to really tackle all the risks and all the potential impacts um, of AI. Uh, but whatever the final outcome of the AI Act discussions will be, um, risk management frameworks, uh, human rights or, or fundamental rights impact assessments will be absolutely key to ensuring um, not just mere legal compliance, but uh, a true respect for these fundamental rights uh, as we move to a society where AI is much more widely used and deployed than today. So against this background, uh, I would now leave the floor to, to our excellent speakers, experts. Um, but first, uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we will first have a series of presentations with slides. Uh, we have uh, allowed a little bit more time than usual for these panels because this is a highly technical um, uh, area. So we will have 10 to 12 minutes for each speaker. Then we will try to take at least one question quickly after each presentation. And if we are disciplined enough, that might still allow us a couple of minutes for questions uh, afterwards. So I hope that this works for everyone. And with that, I will like to welcome our first speaker, David Wright, who is the Chief Research Officer and founder of Trilateral Research. He has developed and won many EU-funded projects in areas including privacy, data protection, surveillance, cybersecurity, AI, ethics, the environment, and I stop here. He currently coordinates the EU-funded CC driver projects on the human and technical drivers of cybercrime. David, over to you, and I see that you, we have your slides already on the screen. Yes. Please. Th thanks, Anna. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'd like to speak about the different types of AI risk assessment. So first question, why do we need an AI risk assessment? Well, as we just heard in the previous session, AI poses all kinds of different types of risks. 
And there's no question that AI systems have vulnerabilities and attackers are looking for them, so that's why. Uh, the AI uh, risk assessment uh, has attracted a lot of interest from different uh, stakeholders and they've prov provided or pro proposed different types of AI risk assessment. Uh, we conducted, Trilateral conducted a survey of those different types of AI risk assessment last year. Um, and uh, one of the things that we noticed was that AI risk assessments vary according to the target stakeholders. Other thing that we learned uh, from our survey is that there is no commonly accepted model for AI risk assessment. So there's different types that you find around the world. So we, we identified three main types of AI risk assessment. The first type of risk assessment comes from assessing uh, the risks arising from the use of AI. The second type uh, is a classification of AI systems according to the level of risk that they pose. And the third type is using AI to find and assess risks in different systems. The second type uh, that I just mentioned, uh, according to different classifications of risk, are, have been proposed in the uh, AI Act from the Commission. Um, instead of uh, uh, calling for a risk-based approach, some people have called for a human rights-based approach to AI risk assessment. And also, I think AI risk assessments have to be seen within a, a broader um, ecosystem of different ways of dealing with the harmful impacts of AI. Um, some of them you know very well, um, like uh, AI uh, ethics by design, um, and in a post-deployment um, mode uh, in terms of monitoring and auditing the different types of risk assessments. Um, I should distinguish between AI risk assessment, AI impact assessment, and AI risk management. All of them are close to each other. They're quite similar, but there's some slight important differences. AI risk assessment is looking for risks. AI impact assessment is looking for impacts, whether those impacts are positive or negative. And AI risk management is about managing the risks that you identify. AI risk assessment, I would say, is subsumed within AI risk assessment as well as AI risk management. Um, I won't go into this uh, slide, but uh, these are the kind of the issues that we addressed in the survey that we did of uh, AI risk assessment last year. And just briefly regarding the third type of AI risk assessment. So uh, in that case, the third case, attackers and defenders are using AI to find vulnerabilities. Um, hence, uh, an AI vulnerability assessment is a type of AI risk assessment. Um, a vulnerability assessment similar to an AI risk assessment is um, looking for vulnerabilities and doing so on a periodic basis. It's necessary to do it on a periodic basis because some risks that you might not identify initially might become only apparent as the development of the AI system goes on. Um, there's a very good article on uh, vulnerability assessment using AI which is referenced here. Um, I won't go into any detail about it. Um, it's also important as we develop AI risk assessments to um, keep standards in mind as we, as we do so. Um, we think the uh, AI uh, cybersecurity certification called for in the Cybersecurity Act um, released by the Commission in 2019 uh, should be an important part of that certification process. AI risk assessment should be an important part of cybersecurity certification. And we are trilateral, very interested in that, um, that uh, activity and we're in fact putting together a consortium and a response to the call by the Commission on cybersecurity certification. 
Um, and also, I should make a point that it's quite possible that different standards will be needed for the different types of AI risk assessment. And here, um, I'm listing some of the um, standards that are emerging right now on AI that are quite relevant to AI risk assessment. So a few conclusions. Uh, one is that AI risk assessment should be an ongoing process throughout the design, development, and deployment of AI technologies. Um, we think there's a very good chance to have some kind of international alignment with regard to AI risk assessment since many of the uh, methodologies that we surveyed last year uh, share common principles. Many principles are the same. Um, AI is obviously developing rapidly. It's developing in different sectors. It has to, um, I think, lead to faster development of standards as well. Um, preferably in line with the um, EC's uh, proposed AI regulation. Um, and final point, uh, at Trilateral we adopt an integrated approach to AI risk assessment. In other words, we combine ethics, data protection, and socioeconomic impacts when we consider AI risk assessment. And I think that's my last slide. If you want some more information about any of the points that I raised, please uh, have a look at these sites here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David, you've, and thank you. You've been very, very disciplined uh, and brief regarding the time. Um, are there any questions at this stage? I would actually have one. Oh, there is one. Yeah, go. Uh, hello, thank you for a uh, great presentation. I'm Victoria from Leiden University. Uh, yeah, uh, my question uh, is about uh, to conduct risk assessments, how you identify risks. So it must be evidence-based or just you try to uh, foresee what are the upcoming harms, like how you decide the vulnerabilities. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I think we've developed quite a good risk assessment methodology. Um, uh, and we apply it particularly in the projects that we um, undertake for the European Commission. Um, we use something called a touch point table to examine every single task in a project to see whether we can identify any risks um, or any threats or any vulnerabilities. And we do that on a task by task basis. And then we um, speak to the task leader and say, these are the vulnerabilities, these are the risks that we've identified. Do you agree? And uh, as a result of that discussion, often some of the risks that we've identified are real risks. Some of them are irrelevant. Um, but at the end of the day, we try to come up with some solutions. And we run those solutions by uh, our ethics advisory board. Almost every single project has an ethics advisory board. So we run those solutions by the ethics advisory board and see if they agree with what we've done or whether they have some su other suggestions for solutions. Um, in addition to those, we um, talk to uh, stakeholders who we think are interested in or are affected by the project or the development that we're uh, undertaking the risk assessment for. So in that way, uh, we combine uh, reviews with internal stakeholders as well as uh, external stakeholders. So we think it's quite an effective way to identify threats and vulnerabilities. Anyone else? If not, then I propose we move, we move on to our next speaker, who is Francesca Fanucci, a senior legal advisor at the European Center for Non-For-Profit, Not-For-Profit Law, where she works on projects addressing the impact of digital technologies and, and artificial intelligence on civic freedoms. Francesca also represents the Conference of International NGOs of the Council of Europe at the Council of Europe Committee on Artificial Intelligence. 
And instead of listing all her remaining affiliations, I would prefer to give you her personal motto, which is, human rights protection doesn't stifle innovation. On the contrary, it nurtures it by making it more reliable. For this reason, she believes we can and we should break the silos between policymakers, academics and industry on the one hand and non-digital civil, civil society groups on the other by promoting inclusivity in human rights impact assessment. Francesca, the floor is yours. I'm, I'm not, is it working? Yeah, I'm not standing up for elections. So it's really what I truly <laughs> believe. But thank you for inviting me to this very insightful panel. I've already learned a lot from David's excellent presentation. And all I can really share with you is the perspective of a civil society representative, a non-tech civil society representative, in, on what we believe, uh, imp uh, how we believe a human rights impact assessment should be conducted and hopefully even mandated in an inclusive way. So, uh, first of all, we would like to start by acknowledging a definition that was first given by the Danish Institute for Human Rights in their excellent guidance for human rights impact assessment on digital activities in 2020. So we very much agree that it is overall a process for identifying, understanding, assessing and addressing, first of all, the adverse effects of, uh, in this case, AI technologies on the human rights enjoyment. And yes, we, we do agree with what David said about uh, risk assessment, uh, impact assessment and risk management being closely related, but we, go, we would go even further and argue that they are all part of the same seamless process, which means that when we assess, for instance, the adverse effect of an AI system or of a technology in general, we obviously have to bear in mind the positive outcome that that uh, application aims to achieve, so the intended purpose more often than not. And but on top of that, we also want to be keen to explore the potentially unintended purpose. Or in case, for instance, of AI for general purposes, there may be more than one purpose. So we need to be aware of positive and negative effects. On top of that, we expect a human rights impact assessment to be cognizant of the context in which uh, it, the system will operate and also uh, to uh, examine the severity of the impact, the scale, um, which is part of the, the scope essentially, because obviously the automation included in some of these systems may scale up the harm, may not reduce it to a few individuals, but to bigger groups of society. And therefore, uh, it is obvious uh, necessary to uh, uh, explore mitigation uh, techniques, how these risks uh, can, or if they can, be reduced or eliminated at all. We also believe that this impact assessment should not be simply conducted ex ante, at the beginning before, being put, before the system is put into service, but they should be iterative. So they should be conducted throughout the life cycle of the system. And last but not least, we want, obviously, this methodology to include uh, uh, multi-stakeholder involvement, uh, both in the impact assessment as such and in the oversight of the system. And obviously, we would also like to uh, have a transparency of access of the findings of this impact assessment. We dream big, I know, and uh, when it comes to expectation from the EU AI Act, we, we, we dream even bigger, because uh, we would like uh, to see both developers and deployers, the ones that in the AI Act are known as users, not to be confused with the end users, but we would like to both have obligations to conduct human rights impact assessments. And why is that? This doesn't mean that we want to uselessly uh, duplicate uh, an impact assessment already conducted by the developers. But as I said before, depending on the context where the product is going to be used, uh, it is necessary to have the perspective of the users and a preliminary assessment of them as well. I'll give you an example, AI in the public sector. 
a public sector may decide to procure a brand new system and uh, or to purchase a system already in existing and adapting it for the uh, implementation of public services. Depending on the context in which that system will be used, there will have to be another assessment conducted probably in partnership with the developers, uh, but uh, it entails obligations and responsibility from the users as well. Obviously, when we talk about impact assessment the, uh, and this type of extensive impact assessments, the argument we hear as a country is that, but you want a one-size-fits-all impact assessment that is going to be burdensome on uh, users and deployers. No, actually what we advocate for is uh, something like a two-tier system where there is a preliminary assessment for all systems uh, based on the impact that they will have on rights, rule of law and democracy as well. And then based on uh, the preliminary findings, you can decide to proceed or not with the more thorough or full human rights impact assessment. So um, we also would like this impact assessment to be uh, fully integrated with the existing accountability mechanisms like the data protection impact assessment, the auditing of algorithms, the broader due diligence frameworks that are already being uh, considered, uh, for instance, at even level, the procurer requirements, and so on. On top of that, we uh, advocate for uh, the establishment of a database uh, that includes where all AI systems in our ideal world, but at least all AI systems used in the public sectors should be registered with all data about the impact assessment. And this is because we need to have evidence uh, reliable in case these systems uh, may uh, show uh, during their life cycle risks uh, or uh, impacts that were not detected at first. And obviously, oversight mechanisms and methods for effective engagement of stakeholders, particularly of marginalized, vulnerable groups and non-tech stakeholders. Now, I would also like to point out to the barriers, the challenges that we are experiencing as non-tech civil society in terms of uh, participation in these impact assessments. First of all, uh, the, the hype of the AI, AI definition. We have been probably going been going to, to, to several of these conferences and we are used to the by now to the definition of AI being open. But for civil society, for individuals, the definition as such, artificial intelligence, still uh, evokes uh, images of uh, androids, uh, uh, robots, uh, still in uh, our roles as human, uh, HAL 9000 style of uh, software. So this scares of people that don't realize we are talking about applications that are algorithm-based decision-making systems that are already embedded, permeating in their lives, in their phones, in their TV, in their Alexa. And it sounds like something that we, we get take for granted, but, but it's not. So we really need to keep working on the narrative as well as on the literacy of the people. And I also list uh, other types of difficulties that we face, like, for instance, consultations with civil society that are not tailored to the specific needs of the groups that are consulted. Sometimes I hear companies that, you know, they're well-meaning, they do want to consult with groups, but what they do is that they send out questionnaires. First of all, the first question that st stems to mind is that, who wrote those questionnaires? Did you consult the very, the, the very groups that you are consulting to, to, to even write those questions? Because they are very technical, they do not understand, and then, yes, people complain they don't have the capacity to be responsive. Mm -hmm. More often than not, these consultations are also based on a ad hoc needs of a company. A company wants to test the product to go into the market, and they need to consult with civil society. But perhaps it would be better to have an ongoing dialogue with civil society to check their needs and so that they are ready and understand what comes next. So obviously, I mean, you can see from the slide, lack of transparency, you no know, accountability systems, and like I said, on the other side is the mostly essentially the, the self-restraint that civil society uh, um, exercise on itself because they are not keen to engage in something A, they don't understand, B, they don't feel they have the resources to fully master and contribute. 
Finally, uh, so how do we try to break the silos and build these bridges that I put in my motto in my introduction? And here comes also a little bit of shameless uh, self-promotion of our activities, because what we did originally last year, until April this year, is we took part uh, in, a, we set up a working group uh, courtesy of the Mozilla Foundation uh, Festival working groups. And we uh, invited, actually we received uh, more than 130 individuals that took part online in ongoing discussions in this working group, trying to, uh, first of all, understand what we mean by meaningful uh, uh, engagement of uh, civil society in uh, impact assessment and discuss what kind of uh, methodologies uh, we uh, would need to use, to devise and use for underrepresented people. This uh, work, uh, like I said, included, it was truly multi-stakeholder because we had the participation of uh, vulnerable groups, uh, representative, but also of companies like Twitter, Meta, um, and uh, Google. So it was an opportunity uh, to, to, to share different voices and express different needs. And now these, the, the findings of this group, which we are still putting together because we really received a lot of material to work on and trying to streamline, but it has now morphed into another initiative which is ongoing, just about started, which is the Action Coalition on Civic Engagement in AI Design. And this is under the umbrella of the Tech for Democracy initiative launched by the Danish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It is an open multi-stakeholder group, uh, again, and we are uh, going to organize thematic workshop with the ultimate uh, uh, purpose to develop a guidance framework that's going to be the output on how to include meaningfully external stakeholders in uh, um, human rights impact assessments of AI system. And then uh, our hope is to be able to pilot, pilot this guidance framework uh, in uh, uh, some uh, states and by some companies and by some stakeholders and receive uh, uh, feedback uh, uh, that uh, we will also channel into another action coalition on responsible technology that is uh, um, led by the Danish Institute for Human Rights and partners including the UN uh, Office of Human Rights BTEC group. Thank you for your attention. So, I mean, last but not least, I would say, you know, we, we don't have a link on the website of the Danish Ministry yet, but I will uh, disseminate it because if any of you as stakeholders, academics, students are interested to take part in this Action Coalition Group, you are very welcome to join. We really want to lead by the example and be truly open to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, Gianclaudio Margeri. Um, I, I, I find very, very uh, inspiring because we have a lot of discussion about impact assessment. This is a way to operationalize it. And it's not just the human rights uh, impact assessment of AI is not just uh, inspiring, but it's useful and necessary. But there is an intellectual obstacle that I have as a researcher, and I'm asking you, Severity. How we measure severity on fundamental rights uh, impact? Because we can measure risks in terms of likelihood, but severity is not easy, right? I, I had this problem with my research, so I'm asking if you have some clues, also other people in the, in the panel, about the severity measurement of, uh, of um, uh, human rights impact. Thank you. Yes, I think this paves the way nicely to the presentation <laughs> of Professor Mantelero because it is an aspect that we have discussed a lot and we did have lots of It was discussion. all organized. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, essentially because obviously there are issues about how do you measure do you, with qualitative or quantitative numerically and uh, long-term effect, uh, the probability that falls into the severity as well. This is all something that uh, he will be able to expand on. Thank you. Yeah, to wait, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think indeed that was perfect. I mean, in, in your presentations, there were cross references to, uh, to the Danish Institute for Human Rights, of course, so we could have followed up with that. But in fact, we agreed before to, uh, to go to Alessandro first. 
So uh, you probably all know Professor Alessandro Montelero, Mantelero, who is Associate Professor of Law and Technology at Polytechnic University of Turin, and also a Jean Monnet Chair in Mediterranean Digital Societies and Law. He has served as an expert on AI, data protection and human rights for the Consultative Committee of Convention 108 and the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence, known as CAHAI. That's the Council of Europe. His latest book is Beyond Data, Human Rights, Ethical and Social Impact Assessments in AI, just out this year. Please, Alessandro. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And uh, yes, the idea was exactly to try to address uh, in a very pragmatical way the problem of uh, how to operationalize, I know that the, the verb is very uh, tough, but uh, uh, how to put in practice human rights impact assessment and uh, fundamental rights impact assessment in the context of AI and use this as an instrument for human rights due diligence. I think these are the two elements that are very important. There are a lot of discussion about human rights. We all want to human rights. Oh, we all want impact assessment about human rights. But we need something that also translate this desire in something that is measurable in something that uh, provide has uh, some feedback uh, in terms of uh, the entity of the impact. And this is clear state in the uh, Artificial Intelligence Act proposal, because if we deal with high risk, it means that we have to measure when the risk is high, when the risk is medium, when the risk is low. So I think that is important to focus on that. And uh, so from this perspective, uh, first of all, it's important to say that uh, the human rights impact assessment, fundamental rights impact assessment, that we want to implement in the AI, AI artificial intelligence regulation is not the traditional human rights impact assessment that we already know because there is experience in the field of human rights impact assessment but human rights impact assessment usually is specific focus on specific contexts um, on a large scale impact, but very focused in a specific region. The typical example is an industrial plan in a specific region that have an impact on the um, availability of houses, uh, on the work of the people, uh, on the access to, to some services, etc. This human rights impact assessment usually is an ex post exercise. When the company uh, realizes that there are some concerns, they carry out an impact assessment, and the result is a sort of policy document that suggests the company how to better address the challenge that uh, its activity has created in a specific area. But if we look at uh, artificial intelligence devices and services, the scenario is different. Uh, these scenarios and services, regardless the case of uh, uh, smart cities, but um, for the rest of the case, they are distributed around. They are in our device, in all around, and are all around the world. So are not territory focused in many cases. And also in terms of impact, we have not a typical impact that we see in human rights that are so in deep in many aspects of society. In many cases, are, are circumscribed to some specific aspect related to the specific application. And last point, very important also from the AI Act uh, perspective, is that uh, the impact assessment is a prior assessment. It's not something that responds to an existing challenge, but it's something that should be used to design the technology, that should be used to design the AI product. It's not the last mile. It's not something that we have to do after the product is on the market. So the mindset is different. and. In this sense, we can benefit from the experience in the field of human rights impact assessment. Danish Institute, for instance, have done a great work in the past years in this, in this field. But we have to adequate to contextualize the artificial impact, uh, the human rights impact assessment in the context of, uh, of AI. And in this sense, I think that uh, one of the crucial points is the fact that we need some threshold, some quantifiable risk threshold. Why we need that? First of all, because in the AI Act, as you know, the proposal, there is a reference to high risk. But it's not clear why some application are high risk. It's a mainly a political decision at the moment. In the future, the Commission will add further category is in the proposal. But who decide that uh, new applications are of high risk? What is the evidence? Francesca mentioned the evidence. What is the evidence that say that that application is of high risk? If you have no any instrument, to uh, measure the impact, you cannot have this kind of evidence. 
And this evidence is very important also for the acceptability of the AI, of artificial intelligence based product and services. Citizens should know what is the impact and the acceptability is really connected with the level of impact. Third point, uh, in the, a regulated system like the Future AI Act, uh, uh, there are connection between the level of risk and the obligation. If there is an high, medium, or low risk, there are different kind of obligation. Although it's not so shaped into the taste for the moment, but we already see that for high risk and for no high risk, there are different kind of obligation. Only transpires for the later and much more for the first category. And so, of course, this means that uh, this uh, assessment is no longer the typical policy instrument that we have in human rights impact assessment, but it's something different in terms of legal compliance. And it's also an important tool for, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm alive. <laughs> okay. It's okay. I didn't mean to be so spectacular. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. We well, need the risk impact assessment well, well on, we the, on the, on yeah, the yeah. <laughs> We are tested. Start from the base. <laughs> yeah. It's a very disruptive topic, I can <laughs> say. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the last point was the fact that uh, the, if you design something new in terms of AI, you have to assess what is the best design that you can use. And uh, of course, if I have two potential solutions in developing a product or a service, uh, the level of impact of solution A and B should be compared. So, Impact assessment is also useful for that. What is the problem? As mentioned also by David and by Francesca, there are a lot of proposals, but not a lot of methodology on impact assessment. And on this regard, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, standardization because uh, standard works well in technical application where the pattern more or less is the same, like in uh, cyber act, act in cyber crime, et cetera. But in human rights, each specific project is specific context as it's peculiar nature that should be addressed. And this is also what we know from privacy impact assessment, data privacy impact assessment. The strong point of this kind of model is the open nature, the flexibility they have, and the case specific approach. So I'm very skeptical about the idea to create a standard. One thing is creating a, a model, a methodology. Other things is creating a standard. And it's even more uh, critical, the things, if uh, the standard is in the end of the technical guys of the standard bodies, that I fully respect that, but in many cases, I have not a specific skills and background in human rights. And uh, on the other hand, if we need a contextual model, if we need a, a methodology to take into account the specific nature of uh, the impacted rights and the application that we want to use, an important role is, of course, by expert and by risk estimation. So, to address Giancarlo answer, uh, how to estimate risk? Uh, of course, there are three typical parameters that the risk identification, in this case, is easy because it's human rights or fundamental rights, likelihood and severity. Uh, on likelihood and severity measure in on many documents, there are different kind of approaches, uh, uh, partial uh, analysis of the problem, etc. But we can summarize in four points. Uh, likelihood is not only the probability of an adverse consequence, but is also the exposure. In many cases, this last point is not considered. Uh, make difference if the impact is one pe on three people or uh, 100 people. So the exposure is an element that should be considered and assessed. And uh, severity is not only the gravity of prejudice that can be assessed based on the experience that we have in the field of uh, uh, human rights, so basically uh, looking back to the uh, case law and all the, the knowledge that we have in the sector in the similar way that we do in other fields like environment impact assessment or data protection impact assessment. But this includes also the effort to overcome the prejudice that can be caused by the use of AI. And then we go in a bit more technical, but we need models, so we need to be technical. Uh, a model is based on matching this value. So for instance, probability and exposure have to be matched in order to create a likelihood. There are some technicalities that we should consider. First, if you create a model that is based on uh, uh, scale, the first point is using a scale that avoids the average position. For this reason, we have four degrees, low, medium, high, and very high. 
Um, second, we have to provide a definition of uh, the, the, the impact with regard to the features that we consider and in this description of sign intent. But the, the, inter the interesting point of this model is that we use cardinal scale. What it means cardinal scale? It means that if you look uh, at the bottom on the right, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, that table is a matrix in which there is not a multiplication or a sum of uh, the values. And why not? Because this is a very mathematical driven idea. It's the idea that it's easy to assess the human rights uh, putting together some figures. But this is not the exercise that we want. The idea is that beyond these figures, there are experts. There are spe experts that consider the specific AI application and the specific context. And match that values in terms of what it means a low probability match with a medium exposure and sort out that table. So the table is not always the same, cannot be standardized. The table is project specific, is case specific and relay, rely on the expertise of those that as an expert serve in the, the bodies, the committee that carry out this uh, impact assessment. And uh, to do that, of course, then we match the different values and we have a final uh, uh, result in terms of impact assessment. But what is very important, the impact assessment is not for the AI product in uh, its integrity, it's in all its dimension. Because the impact is on specific rights and freedom. So we cannot say that there is a product that's a high impact on human rights. No, we can say in a product that, that in this case, a high impact on privacy, has a medium impact on something that I don't see, and <laughs> has a low impact on integrity. So this is the radial graph that is very useful to design, because this is the goal, to support AI manufacturer to design. After this analysis, the AI manufacturer can start mitigating the higher risk, define a, the measure that mitigates the risk, take into account the EF, so the, the, the elements that, uh, uh, that are imposed by the law, for instance. So there are some factors that are external factors that are mandatory, and you cannot change it. And so, of course, in that case, you cannot mitigate. And then after the exercise, you can run another uh, impact assessment, and hopefully the result will be that your radiograph change and reduce the impact. It's a bit technical, but the desire was to create a model that could be useful and discuss in the future debate on AI, and if you want to know more, the book will be available in open access, quite expensive for me and my university, uh, in, uh, in, a few, in a few days, so at least uh, in a few weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And I wonder whether there are any questions. Please. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm from the University of Groningen doing my PhD. Um, so what I understood from you is kind of that, so this table that you just showed, it's not really standardized, it's something that's kind of tailored on the basis also of expert opinions. And I really like that because to me it sounds then that we're using high levels of expertise and tailoring to the specific context or the AI project. But my question for you is, despite the fact that I think it's amazing, do you think it's very feasible? Because it sounds like it requires a high level of expertise and also a lot of tailoring to specific projects. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that experts are the key element. And for this reason, for instance, in the book, there is an entire section on the role of expert and the expert committees. Uh, the expert committees is something like the ethics committees, but in a broader composition that include the different expertise, not only ethical expertise. And uh, of course, uh, engaging expert can be uh, a cost for the company, but uh, we can imagine, and in the book there are some analysis of some experience, that we already have company that have ethical boards, uh, our external advisor board, etc. So if you want to go into the market of AI, you have to address this kind of uh, burden, I think. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, for startup, uh, this could be a challenge uh, in terms of uh, having this kind of expertise. Uh, but uh, uh, to be very frank, I, I, I'm a, a bit uh, uh, strong on this point. Uh, I think that uh, 
AI and technology should not be driven by the economic uh, consideration. Uh, or if you prefer, we have to decide. If you want to invest in an a economic-driven AI, we can do that, but then we stop to have a CPDP and something like that. Uh, but if we want uh, to have an AI that is uh, based on human rights, that is a, a real trustworthy, uh, human-centric, or whatever you want AI, you need to invest. Companies need to understand. At the end, our community as a privacy expert know that since the 90s, companies comp uh, were very critical about data protection, blah, 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 and now they have data protection officer carry out data protection impact assessment that since the business carry out without any big issue. So uh, I think, I don't know if I fully address your, your, your question, but my answer is yes, we need expertise. It's not so difficult to have expertise. Expertise can work on different projects uh, for the same company or for a bunch of company. So I think it's not impossible and it's something that we already have. For instance, if you look to the medical sector, they all have uh, ethics bodies in the hospital, each hospital has an ethics committee. So it's not something possible. I don't know if I fully address. If not, I'm happy to, to continue the discussion of the panel. Thank you. Any further questions? I think we are good on time. So actually, if I may, I would, I would have one to you. Uh, you mentioned synergies between human rights impact assessment and the DPIAs. Could you maybe briefly expand on that a little bit? Do you see a way of yeah, yeah. addressing both, you know, killing two birds with one stone? Yeah, this is a topic that uh, I have a, an opinion different from other colleagues that are here in the room. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about the fact that the data protection impact assessment can be used and transformed in a human rights impact assessment for the AI. Uh, I, I think that uh, there are two important instruments, but the value of having a fundamental or human rights impact assessment is to give the exact value to the rights, human rights or fundamental rights. Impact, data protection impact assessment was created focusing on data protection. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mm -hmm. said in the context of Council of Europe, uh, data protection is an enabling right, so of course have an impact on other rights. But uh, of course when you assess the impact on uh, the freedom of expression, for instance, you need to have in mind what it means freedom of expression, what is the case though. And that if you look at the practical experience of data protection impact assessment, in many cases they are very focused on the the logic of data protection impact assessment. I uh, carry out uh, uh, an extensive research on uh, 600 cases of data protection mm -hmm. authorities in, in Europe, and the result was, for instance, that in the decision of the, the authority, they do not refer to fundamental rights into the details. They use category like uh, proportionality, balance of interest, uh, but it's not clear how to assess, because mm -hmm. they use the category of data protection, GDPR, that's fine, but this is, uh, the idea to have a human rights impact assessment, to emphasize the human rights, the impact of human rights. I think they could coexist. So uh, to, f to give an answer to, to your question, I think they could coexist. So we need data protection impact assessment for the part of the data, but we need the human rights for the rest that is beyond the data in this sense. Thank you very much. And with that, we are on to our last speaker, Catherine bloch Weiberg who is a senior advisor on business and human rights at the already mentioned several times Danish Institute for Human Rights. In addition to her role as a senior specialist on business and human rights, Catherine manages the Responsible Value Chains program, a program aimed at supporting and promoting responsible business in global value chains. Catherine is also leading on the business and human rights tech work of the Institute, which includes the development of guidance on human rights impact assessment guidance for digital business activities. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you uh, for inviting me to come here um, to speak today about our work around human rights impact assessment of digital business activities. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, our institute and work has been mentioned several times today. I hope um, I can do it justice by explaining to you um, our approach um, and the reason why we embarked upon looking at uh, human rights impact assessment specifically as it pertains to digital business activities. 
So just as a point of departure, I just wanted to highlight the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which really underpin a lot of the work that we're doing uh, within the area of business and human rights and have become, in general, the authoritative framework on business and human rights, uh, both for businesses but also non-business actors. And they've been approved by the Human Rights um, Council back in 2011, um, and they um, include principles that address the human rights impacts of economic actors on human rights. And the reason why I say economic actors more broadly instead of just mentioning business is that these principles, um, the expectation around due diligence as it relates to human rights, um, are principles that can apply across various economic activities. So not just when uh, businesses themselves are conducting their economic activities, uh, but also uh, when, for example, state actors um, invest in or procure from uh, business actors and are themselves an economic actor in the way that they, um, that they work. So it includes both principles on the state to protect against corporate-related uh, human rights abuses, so putting in place frameworks, policies, etc., and um, and the role of economic actors in respecting human rights uh, throughout their value chains, which means putting a, in place a process of human rights due diligence, which includes identifying, assessing, addressing, mitigating, and reporting on um, their human rights impacts across all of their activities and business relationships, considering all rights. So that's basically what the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights um, say. And how does this then apply to the context of artificial intelligence and the impacts associated with artificial intelligence? Of course, we've heard about uh, some of these during previous panels today, also during this uh, panel. Um, so issues around uh, privacy, uh, the rights to privacy impacts, um, discrimination-related impacts, um, et cetera. Um, and yeah, as you can see from these headlines, there's been a lot of focus on the various human rights impacts of artificial intelligence um, technologies. And then because of this, of course, there's been a call internationally to really focus on uh, how do we then identify, address, or assess and address these human rights impacts of artificial intelligence. So I've included here just to, to illustrate, you know, both at the, the EU level, Council of Europe level, we have also at the UN level, uh, a number of different calls for the need to conduct human rights impact assessment of artificial intelligence technologies. So how do we then go about doing that in practice? So now we know, you know, there is an issue um, there is a call for impact assessments. Um, how should we then go about conducting these impact assessments? We've heard a lot of good examples of how to do that here. Um, just to give you a bit of an introduction to our journey, so the Danish Institute for Human Rights, we've been working on the topic of human rights in impact assessment um, for many years, um, eight, nine years. Um, and. Um, very much focused on, as was also mentioned before, the more kind of physical types of business activities, large infrastructure projects, oil and gas companies, uh, ag agricultural companies that have a very clear physical footprint. Um, and what we did back in, in 2016 and updated back in 2020 was to develop a guidance and toolbox for human rights impact assessment, um, which has also received a reward within the International Association of Impact Assessors in 2018, um, because it has become one of the most authoritative frameworks on human rights impact assessment. But when it comes to looking at the human rights impact assessment of digital business activities, we did find that the methodology had some areas where it could be you know, improved or elaborated on as it relates specifically to the types of impacts that we're looking at when we look at digital business activities. And maybe also just to mention that um, 
before I move on to our work on human rights impact assessment of digital business activities, that we've also been working on how do we integrate human rights more broadly into other impact assessment dis disciplines. So that includes also environmental impact uh, assessments or social impact assessments. So how to get human rights into those spaces. Again, those spaces also being highly dominated by a more um, traditional kind of business context focus. So oil and gas, large infrastructure projects. So we embarked upon a project back in 2018 to um, look at how can our methodology on human rights impact assessment be adopted to uh, digital activities. So what we did was that we um, identified that there was a need for guidance, that there were expectations, there were demands, there was actually a large um, need also from within the private sector for more clarity on what does human rights impact assessment look like when it comes to our digital activities. And what we did was that we engaged with various stakeholders within the digital space. So we worked both with uh, larger uh, companies um, within the tech space. Uh, we worked with uh, consultants that have been providing advisory services on identifying human rights impacts and social impacts and ethics impacts of, um, of uh, technology companies. We worked with academics that had been within this space as well in civil society and convened them all around developing this human rights impact assessment guidance, which was published back in 2020. And um, the idea was really to consider what are the impacts across the digital uh, ecosystem um, and you know, really underlining this whole consultation process really underlined the need for further adaptation and considerations of the uniqueness when it comes to digital activities, especially as it pertains to the need for stakeholder engagement and how that plays out when you're looking at activities that are taking place within the digital sphere. So how do you even go about identifying the um, actually or potentially impacted rights holders? And how do the, you go about engaging with them in a meaningful way to get their impact, on, uh, their input on the development of the technology, as well as the local context? So back to, to the point raised before that, you know, these uh, technologies have many potential uses in many potential com uh, contexts. So how do you go about um, identifying that context, which is also quite central to conducting your impact assessment when it comes to understanding the regulatory framework and the context analysis of the impact assessment. So um, in reality, even though we did publish the impact assessment guidance, it also continues to highlight some of the challenges that we see specifically when it comes to um, human rights due diligence of digital technology. So not just kind of the impact assessment process as such, but also the broader concept of identifying, assessing, and addressing human rights impacts um, of digital technologies. Um, and again, back to I what I said before, it's really that lack of, of potential geographical boundary or at least lack of insights into what type of, of potential impacts are associated with the technology without knowing where it will be applied and what are the particular human rights challenges in that context that might be exacerbated or, um, or increased by the yeah, uh, involvement of that technology. Stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned before, how do you identify the rights holders that are impacted? How do you engage with them in a meaningful way? Um, I think what we've had mentioned is uh, that the various uh, EU uh, regulations that, that pertain to tech, they focus to some extent on risk identification, on transparency around risk identification, but transparency doesn't equal meaningful stakeholder engagement. And that, uh, and on stakeholder engagement, those um, policy measures are, to some extent, I would uh, claim, uh, relatively silent. So how do we get that uh, more emphasized there? And then finally, when do you do your assessment? So we've had some uh, perspectives on, you know, ex post, ex and before, you know, in the development of the technology, once it's been applied. Um, when is it most meaningful to conduct the impact assessment? If it is a standalone 
human rights impact assessment? Um, is it once the impact has occurred? Is it in the development? How can you identify what the types of impacts are without having seen it play out in reality? Again, back to the lack of geographical boundaries and uh, the challenges around stakeholder engagement. So just to summarize <laughs> some of the key principles in the, the impact assessment uh, methodology that, that we've developed, um, what uh, it includes are these various stages of impact assessment uh, from planning and scoping, data collection, um, analyzing uh, impacts, impact uh, prevention and mitigation and reporting. So again, back to kind of looking at that full scope as David explained in the, uh, in the beginning. Um, and it's built up around these key criteria for human rights impact assessment. And again, uh, back to what I mentioned before, uh, just highlighting two of them, you know, the key process criteria for how you conduct your human rights impact assessment of ensuring participation um, of various uh, stakeholder groups, including, of course, those rights holders that may be affected by the um, by the digital uh, technology that the assessment covers, um, as well as the transparency and accountability aspects of that. And then um, the content criteria, and here also uh, back to the question that was raised earlier today, um, highlighting the need to do that assessment of impact severity, as well as look at uh, the full scope of potential impacts, so not only impacts that the technology causes directly, but also how it may be contributing, contributing to or linked to causes by other parties as well. So that's also worth considering. And then finally, how it can be used. Um, the guidance is meant to be used both for companies, of course, wanting to um, apply it to their uh, technology solutions. It can be used by states um, to um, improve practices of their own suppliers and developers of uh, technology that go into their uh, activities, as well as by, other, uh, by others, including um, different monitoring institutions to um, monitor uh, the extent to which the digital um, business activities are meeting these criteria around human rights impact assessment, as well as in capacity building and support for those who need to uh, look at these transparency reports or, or other communication by businesses and say, you know, do these actually really reflect the impacts um, and issues that are out there? And here I've listed a few resources, of course, the guidance itself. Um, also, we've done some work with investors um, to uh, help them identify what are some of the human rights issues that they should be expecting of tech giants that they invest in. Um, and uh, we've also worked on looking at uh, how to include the tech sector in national action plans on business and human rights. I've put that here. And then, of course, also, as mentioned before, we're facilitating this action coalition on responsible uh, technology as a part of the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs Tech for Democracy initiative, which really tries to focus in on uh, what are um, the expectations on, uh, on business to act responsibly as it relates to, to human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. So that brings us to the end of our four extremely rich presentations and, and perspectives that I think show, first and foremost, how much work has already been covered, how much is already available. So now the challenge is just to figure out how best to use all these resources. Um, and, and hopefully all of that could somehow fit in the framework of the Future AI Act. Uh, but maybe before we go into that discussion, is there, are there any specific questions to Catherine? Please, and I would invite others who want to ask questions to already line up behind the microphone. We still have uh, a little um, bit of time, please. Uh, maybe it is the way that my brain is wired as both an international law student and a technology law student that I want to identify what we're actually dealing with. So you mentioned the UN framework, business and human rights. There are a lot of discussions about 
the actual nature of this document? Are we talking about soft law? Is it customary international law? Is it the reiteration of the human rights law framework? And I'm wondering if we do consider this customary international law or the reiteration of um, the positive obligations of states, then would human rights impact assessment fit into that rhetoric? Do we see that becoming customary international law? It's so weird to um, categorize it as such because when we're talking about customary international law, we're like talking about 12 mile rule in territorial sea, never like technology, rarely technology. I'm, I'm really interested in your uh, input on that. Thank you. Yeah. Good, uh, good question and something that we actually discuss quite a bit at the Danish Institute, also with our national colleagues that are maybe more kind of within the traditional uh, hard law aspects, aspects around human rights. Um, but just to say that um, I think, you know, there has been, it is in a way, it is a framework. So it is soft law, but it refers to hard law obligation, especially on the states. Then there's been some discussion as to uh, what type of uh, hardness <laughs> the the corporate responsibility to respect related aspects has and there there have actually been some movements lately um, also at the EU level to um, develop more hard law requirements um, on companies to conduct human rights due diligence where the identification assessment and addressing human rights impacts is a part of, of that process um, so there is a hardening of that maybe more soft law uh, measure. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, just to say that that development at the EU level with the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive um, is based on developments that are, have been going on uh, within the last several years within various EU jurisdictions to look at how can we um, how can we hold companies more to account when it comes to conducting their human rights due diligence, not only within your domestic territory, but also when it comes to activities um, abroad for those companies that are headquartered within your uh, territory. So you have the French Duty of Vigilance Act, you have the German Due Diligence Act, you have the Norwegian one, the Dutch one on children's rights, you have the Modern Slavery Act, so you have various um, aspects of those. Um, so just to say that it might have been kind of conceptualized within soft law, referring to hard law obligations, especially on behalf of the state, but now when it comes to the specific expectations on corporate actors, you've seen it becoming more and more ingrained into hard law. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, Bruno Bioni from That Price Brazil. Um, environmental regulation that protect regulation, also recently AI uh, emergency regulation, all of them uh, suffers uh, a critical that they are too procedure and that protection packet assessment, women right impact assessment, the same one, uh, because it gives like a, a large margin of discretionary for the regulators and maybe the whole the regulation is being captured and not only the regulators uh, themselves. So I'd like to ask uh, if you have like the pen to, to draft uh, new uh, regulations or whatever, would be more prescriptive uh, in terms of trying to uh, give a proper methodology or the whole ideas that you came up here right now. Why am I asking this? Because right now in Brazil we are discussing also a, a bill on AI I'm a member of the jurists of commissions that are responsible to try to draft this, and this is the main uh, elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. If you should be more prescriptive or not in those specific sections, trying to articulate properly this uh, regulatory toolbox. Thank you. Who's, please, who wants to go first? And everybody gets to speak, don't worry. Well, okay. Should we, be, should yeah, we be more prescriptive? Uh, my answer would be yes. <laughs> Francesca. I, I would say that the same way as now we are discussing introducing mandatory impact assessments via the, the AI Act, for example, hopefully we also discuss some uh, minimum criteria for impact assessments that would be mandatory in a future potential convention at Council of Europe level. 
but at the same time, uh, yeah, I, I would say yes, we need to be more prescriptive than we actually are, but we don't need to be pedantic in all the details. So we need to make sure that certain criteria are followed, but as uh, also highlighted by Professor Mantelero, sometimes the, the, the context may require different types of assessments, more or less detailed. So I would say we need to give the uh, set of obligations and again, from my vested interest, multi-stakeholder participation in devising the impact assessments as well, shouldn't be missed, it shouldn't be given for granted. So maybe methodology for consultations, a methodology for assessment, criteria like scale, scoping, severity, impact. So in that sense, we need to be more prescriptive than they actually are for sure. But in terms of technicalities and how to conduct it and which, which body should be tasked, uh, which has, this should be left uh, to, the, to the contextual situation, flexibility of the industries and of the institutions that conduct them, in our view, I may not be. Yeah, if I may, I fully agree with you. Uh, by the way, it was our position <laughs> in the CHI. So the, the, the idea is that there are two, two elements in terms of regulation. One element is what you have to put in the regulation, what you can put outside the regulation. In the regulation, of course, you have to put a clear reference to the fact that you want a human or fundamental rights impact assessment, like Article 35 in the GDPR, to, to mention something like that. But then you need to develop the way in which you do that. And this is not an argument that you can put in, in, a, in, a, in a piece of law, of course. This is something that should develop outside the law. Uh, and the discussion is, what is the input that you put uh, in the provi law provision? Of course, you have to find some criteria. Huh? You have to identify some main criteria in order to carry out this impact assessment. Also because there are very various ideas. For instance, in some debates they say, oh, that's nice. The state carry out uh, the human rights impact assessment. Okay, it depends mm. by the state. <laughs> it depends, it depends the on state. which state uh, conducts <laughs> exactly. it. Yeah. Uh, and, and indeed, this was a position by an infamous state that yeah. is now it is outside of the Council of Europe. No naming and shaming. <laughs> yeah, and so the problem is that we have to divide the two elements. And the second point is that we have not, like in privacy and experience, not a lot of experience. And uh, I'm, I'm in favor of flexibility. Uh, at the end, the data protection impact assessment that relay on a broader previous experience was carried out by companies, by data protection authorities, by international body, and we have a, a good uh, state of the art in this field. So I, I prefer not to have a top-down approach from somebody that is entitled to create uh, the Magna Carta for <laughs> the human rights impact assessment, also because, as we mentioned, we all, it's very contextual. Um, I, I'd just like to add that I think um, one thing that we've been looking at when it comes to the various kind of broader due diligence uh, files is um, the, the challenge of creating a proper uh, oversight and follow-up. So you may have requirements around, for example, Modern Slavery Act to do these modern slavery um, statements, um, but how do you ensure, and that's also been critiqued, adequate you know, follow-up of that, and that actually goes in and, and results in, um, in certain um, things being brought up with the companies that have developed these, and that there is actually that this you know, idea of, of developing a regulation with certain requirements around transparency um, is actually being used to change behavior and improve behavior. And similarly with the uh, Duty of Vigilance Act, how do you ensure adequate oversight and follow-up? So that's definitely something, and we've developed a number of publications on this, which I can just make a quick commercial for, uh, just to say that you know, in terms of creating accountability, it's quite important to have um, uh, organizations that are tasked specifically with ensuring adequate um, follow-up of, um, of such regulations um, to ensure compliance of those that, um, that the regulation applies to, such as we have within the data privacy area. So before we all go to lunch, and I know you're impatient, we have one more question or a series of questions? One more question. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Hello. I'm really sorry. Sorry. Um, I have a blasphemic uh, question regarding the interlace of the GDPR, data protection law, and the AI Act, because when I read the Annex 2, so where all these areas are defined, my uh, impression was actually that the interlace uh, of the scope of uh, application of both laws is enormous. I didn't find any, maybe one exception, but all areas where data is collected and used, given the broad definition of personal data, is actually personal data. So we have 
uh, at the same thing, two applicable laws. And so I thought, so why set up a new methodology for, and at least under this intersection, for a new risk methodology? This creates just even more chaos. Why can't we relay, at least in this area, to the same risk methodology as in data protection law, which has uh, had some efforts to develop? Thank you. I hope it's not a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have already... Uh, I, first of all, you're absolutely right that I think there, there, is a, there will be a huge area of overlap between data protection law and obviously the, the AI Act. However, I would also like to stress that um, at least in the Commission's design of the instrument, there will, of course, also be AI applications, uh, you know, purely industrial ones, uh, which will not be, uh, you know, the, 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 the typical kind of general AI or, 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 you know, predictive policing, to use examples from the previous panel, facial recognition or what have you, but would have more industrial applications would still fall under the AI Act, but maybe there this interplay would play a, a lesser role. Huh? So we need to keep that in mind. And then perhaps also just to mention that as explained by Alessandro, the focus is, is maybe a little bit too narrow in the data protection law, even though uh, as, as a data protection authority regulator, we, we do try to see data protection as an enabling right, uh, taking care of you know, many others, eh? freedom of expression to, to give just one example. But uh, yeah, we probably need still a little bit of a different approach Please. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 I, I can only uh, uh, follow your, your, your comment because um, the problem is that to cover all the impacts that AI create in society in terms of variety potential impact, you have to stress very much the data protection framework, data protection impact assessment. I'm very skeptical about the fact that this is the best way to address the problem. It's true that we already have a tool but the tool was not creating having in mind human rights, it was creating having in mind data protection. And if you look at the work on human rights impact assessment, you feel a different kind of approach, also methodological approach. And for this reason, I think that we cannot use an old tool for a new goal. They should coexist because data are still used. And so, uh, and it's very important from my perspective, for instance, that the Data Protection Authority have an important role in the future AI regulation because I'm more skeptical about other kinds of authority. But I think that this is the idea. All right. If there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much to all our panelists for the excellent discussion. Thank you for being so patient with us and uh, bon appétit.